Next, I'm going to talk about p-values. What is a p-value and, and what makes a p-value so useful? So by now you might have already noticed that conducting a statistical task can be quite complicated and involves lots of steps. For example, in the case of the f-test, you first have to compute that test statistic, then you have to figure out the relevant um, degrees of freedom, then you have to compute the critical value, and only then you will know whether your um, test statistic is large enough to reject, right? And the notion of so, um, of what is a big and what is a small test statistic really depends on the degrees of freedom. So it's very hard for you to say, once you if you observe a test statistic, hey, this is going definitely going to, to reject. And this um, sort of problem of interpreting the, the magnitude of test statistics becomes um, even more severe if, if you look at other tests. So there, we have covered the t-test and the f-test, but then there's lots and lots of other tests in econometrics and they all work slightly differently in sort of how they compute critical values and so on. Um, so you would have to know a lot of things and be able to do calculations really, really um, fast in your head if you wanted if, if, if you if you wanted to be able to interpret the magnitude of any given test statistic. So the p-value offers a um, a way of summarizing the result of a test that is much easier to interpret and, and that works universally for all tests. So let me explain it in the context of the um, f-test. So whenever you conduct an f-test, Stata will um, compute a p-value for you. And so what Stata does is, what well, Stata computes the test statistic, so that's some positive number. And so, and for, so for any given sample, right, that this will be, the realized test statistic will be a number. Then Stata figures out the appropriate f-distribution, so it figures out the numerator and denominator degrees of freedom. And so, in, and internally, what Stata does, so basically it is, is drawing this density of the correct F distribution. And then Stata is integrating over this region. So it's integrating to the right of the observed test statistic. And this will give a number, this sort of this area is then called the observed p-value. And by looking at the p-value, you can determine whether the test rejects. And how do you do that? Suppose that the p-value is larger than alpha. What does that mean? Well, alpha is alpha is the probability that is to the right of the critical value, right? So this is alpha. Now, if alpha is smaller than the p-value, then that means the critical value is to the right of the test statistic. This is the only way that alpha can be smaller than the p-value. But if the critical value exceeds the test statistic, so you know, then we know we should not reject. Conversely, if the p-value is more than alpha, the only way this can happen is if the test statistic exceeds the critical values, and then we know we should reject. P-values make it very easy, even for non-experts, to apply the toolbox of statistical testing. 
But with great power comes great responsibility. So let's lay down some ground rules for using p-values. So how do you use statistical testing to, to establish something about the population model? Well, ideally what you do is first you choose several things. You will choose a model. So for example, in appropriate linear regression model that you know, replicates in a sort of, in a reasonable way, sort of how the world around us behaves. Then choose the null hypothesis. For example, we could choose the effect of study time is zero. So you wanna establish significance of study time. And we choose a probability of type one error that, that we are happy to accept. For example, we could put, I'm not sure, should I put 1%? A lot of people use 5%, um, let me put 1%. So once we've done that, we draw a random sample. Now, yeah, obviously, sort of, this is uh, a very sort of idealized way of thinking about it. Most of the time, if you do a new analysis, you will not draw a brand new sample. Sometimes you will realize, reanalyze uh, existing data sets, right? But what I mean here is, even if you have the data already sitting on your hard drive somewhere, you you haven't looked at it and in the sense that you're, you're not with, in your, with your analysis, you're not anticipating any patterns that are particular to this one data set that, that you have. So now you look at the data set and you are ready to compute the p-value. And if the p-value is less than alpha, then you reject H0, which presumably is, is what you want it to do. So this makes you very happy if you're able to do this, right? So we have chosen alpha equal 1%. And now let's suppose that we compute a p-value of point oh. One one four. Oh no, it's it's a little too big, right? So we are not able to reject. We we're not sort of we're not happy, right? We are very unhappy about this. We were not able to show what we set out to uh, what, what what we set out to show when when we started the analysis. We cannot prove our hypothesis, but it's so close, right? We almost rejected. So now that we think about it, we chose 1%, but we were a little unsure about what to choose. And we actually, we did think a little bit about choosing 5%. So now that we see this, why not just go back? And let's just change that, right? To 5%, oh, now we're rejecting, now we're happy again. But so this is, messing with our whole protocol of choosing everything and then looking at the sample, right? Here, so we are going back to choosing things after we've seen the sample. And that's, that messes up our statistical error control. And so the, the, um, the machinery of statistical testing is set up in a way that ensures that we will believe false things uh, for things that are false only with a small probability. But by violating the testing protocol and going back to choosing these kind of things after we've seen the sample, we, we, um, we're messing with this, uh, with the mechanism that makes sure that the error control works, right? And actually then if we do this, statistic testing no longer guarantees anything, right? So we might believe things that are false with whatever probability. Now, so don't do that, right? But maybe that would be too obvious and we wouldn't do it anyway. Um, 
maybe even so we are writing a report where we have to choose alpha equal to 1% or 5%. So it's some, maybe not even something that we have control over. So uh, this thing, uh, even if you don't do this thing, you might be tempted to do another thing. Right, so you uh, you see the p-value and you don't reject, but you were so sure that you would uh, reject, right? You had a large sample, you had a very sensible hypothesis, um, study time should matter, there's no way it's, it's very close to zero. Uh, so there must be something wrong in your choices. So maybe you chose the wrong model, right? So you observe this and maybe what we learn from this is that we shouldn't have chosen this particular model. Maybe we should have different chosen uh, have should have chosen a different linear regression model. We sh maybe we should have included more uh, more control variables and what's not right. So now this is a little more subtle form um, of manipulating the the testing protocol. But again, you're going back. And you're never from you're going from the sample to the um, to those basic choices you uh, you were supposed to make in the beginning, and you're never allowed to go in this direction. Yeah. So when whenever you do that, uh, that is called p-value hacking, which you might think makes you sound like a total badass, but it just means that you don't understand how to apply statistics. A question that often confuses students is, is, uh, is the p-value a probability? And my preferred answer to this is obviously no, because the p-value depends on the random sample, so it's a random quantity, and the probability is supposed to be a number, right? So these two things cannot, cannot be equal. Well, you can modify this question a little bit and say then, well, the realized p-value, that's a number, right? Is that a probability? Um, and it should be, right? P-value, is, is, isn't the P, doesn't the P stand for probability? Well, so it is true that you can interpret the realized p-value um, as a probability that describes you know, the randomness in a certain random experiment. Um, but so the, the uncertainty in this sort of, in this random experiment that is described by the p-value is it doesn't come from the uncertainty in the sample. It's it's sort of the uncertainty that is, uh, um, that isn't really real. It's just uh, in, in our, it's uh, the uncertainty that we generate in a thought experiment. So it's very artificial. So my take on it is there has never been any, um, anything, um, yeah, nothing good can come from thinking of a p-value as a probability. In particular, you should not, so in particular, the p-value, also, also the realized p-value is not the probability that H naught is true. So in so the statistical approach that we are following, so whether the null hypothesis is true or not, that's, that's just something that's determined in the population, it, it's not random, right? So there's no un uncertainty about it. We don't know whether it's true, but there's a population model in which so the truth about, um, the truth of H naught is unambiguous, right? And it, it's deterministic. Um, yeah, the p-value does not give us the probability uh, that H naught is true. So if you want something like this, if you want some, some um, want to measure something like the, is the, the probability that H naught is true, you have to take a completely different approach to statistic. Then you have to look at Bayesian statistics. But then also, they would not interpret the p-value differently. They, they, they have different concepts to deal with quantities like this. Also, the p-value does not give you 
the probability of type 1 error and it does not estimate the probability of type 1 error. Nothing of the sort.